Welcome to If You Love This Planet. I'm Dr. Helen Caldicott, and in this program we talk about the greatest medical and environmental threats to all life, such as nuclear weapons and nuclear power, global warming, ozone depletion, toxic pollution, deforestation, and many other social and political issues that relate to global well-being. So if you love this planet, keep listening. Welcome to If You Love This Planet. I'm Dr. Helen Caldicott, and today I, on the program I'm speaking with Doug Briggy, a professor in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts. His research includes studies of asthma, of the impact of culture and language on health communication, the impact of environmental tobacco smoke, traffic pollution and cardiovascular disease, and the impact of uranium mining and processing on Native Americans. In 2007, Doug Briggy testified before the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform on Uranium Contamination in the Navajo Nation. He has over 100 academic publications that include original research, reviews, policy and historical analysis, and he's associate editor of the Journal of Immigrant and Minority Health. He also wrote a book, The Navajo People and Uranium Mining, published in 2006 by the University of New Mexico Press. Doug Briggy, welcome to If You Love This Planet. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, now, it's interesting, Doug. I started my whole anti-nuclear career, if you like, way back um, in Australia in the 70s by uh, finding out about uranium mining. I, I didn't know anything about uranium or nuclear power until I discovered that Australia owned 40% of, this, of the world's richest uranium. And so I got a book out of the library called Poison Power by Goffman and Tamplin and read about nuclear power. And as a physician, my hair nearly fell out. I'd never read anything so terribly dangerous. And then mm. I got involved in uranium mining and I went around and talked to the miners around Australia and the workers about the dangers. And you have concentrated on this in the United States and, of course, it's the beginning of the nuclear fuel cycle, which is never, ever mentioned or talked about when they talk about the dangers of nuclear power. So would you like to give us a bit of an extrapolation, Doug, um, on, on uranium mining and milling and enrichment and from your perspective and your research? Yes, and, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just say how I came to this because since you gave your story, which is, is different, but it, it leads to the same place, I guess. Um, I, I actually grew up um, uh, on the Navajo Nation in uh, northern Arizona in the 1960s and early 1970s as a child. Uh, I'm a, a white person, a small number of white people who lived there at the time, and, um, uh, and, and I knew nothing about uranium mining and, and had no contact or awareness of it as a child, but uh, years later, when I had moved away and gone to college and graduate school, uh, uh, I, I felt a desire to, to go back there, to reconnect a little bit. And when I did, I discovered that, that the area had been affected heavily by uranium mining, not right where I lived, but on other parts of the Navajo Nation. And uh, because of that, I sought out an opportunity to, to do some work on the issue. I, you know, I had become... Uh, a professional in occupational and environmental health, and I thought maybe I could do something. And uh, together with some Navajo colleagues, uh, people who became colleagues and friends of mine, uh, as we moved forward, we developed a, an oral history project and, and, and published uh, stories about uh, former miners and their widows and children, uh, as well as photographs that, that I took. And, and so that was sort of the starting point. And, and, and at that time, I was really focused on the uranium mining and it was uh, still quite some time later that I began to realize, well, this has some relevance uh, to the broader issue of nuclear power and nuclear weapons, and I began to uh, to look into that as well. But, you know, I, I would really agree with you, and when I made that connection to nuclear power and nuclear weapons, <clears throat> immediately um, 
my thought was, oh, everyone's ignoring the, the miners and the millers and the, and the communities that live by these abandoned mines and, and the impact that it's had on them. And I remember in the, you know, in the 1980s especially, uh, prior to Chernobyl, uh, there was, you know, a lot of people would say nuclear power has never killed anyone. Mm. Well, they you know, I, I don't think <laughs> there are still people who say that. Yeah. But if you look at the whole life cycle and you look at the, 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 the very starting point, the mines and the, the communities near the mines, then, you know, the, the, the toll in, in mortality and morbidity is just really large and is very, very well documented. There's, scientifically, there's no question about the harm, you know, the, the dangers of radon in the underground mines, for example, is, is just proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. So, so, you know, so that was part of what brought me to the broader issue, brought me to the broader issue was, was thinking, wow, somebody's got to inject into this the discussion about nuclear power, what it does, uh, this sort of invisible level where, where people are working as miners or living next to the mines. So, so that was sort of my path, and, 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 I, uh, and, and I guess what I've found is, as I've gone forward is I, every time I meet new people, whether they're from India or Australia or Africa, going to Africa next, uh, in a couple of months uh, to Mali where there's proposed uranium mining, that you know, the stories are so similar, and the same kinds of things have happened, especially frequently impacts on indigenous peoples uh, who, who live closer to the land, who live in the countryside that uh, is, ne- is near where the uranium mi- is mined. So, so I feel like it's a really global uh, story. There's um, impacts all, all over the place. And, it's, and, and as you said, it's not, it's not talked about or as well uh, discussed in sort of the, the larger media uh, framework as, as, you know, nuclear weapons or, or nuclear powers or something like uh, Fukushima or, or Chernobyl. What was it, Doug Briggy, that, that grabbed you emotionally when you went home to the Navajo Nation and lands? What, what were the things that stood out for you that initiated your interest and concern? Well, the initial, my initial interest was probably not that emotional, although I think there was an emotional connection uh, fairly quickly. But initially, I just saw a newspaper article in the Navajo Times mm. uh, talking about uranium mining. I was sort of shocked and surprised and wanted to learn more about it. Um, but once we started doing the project, and especially once we were out in the field and interviewing people, I, you know, the emotion uh, did not come so much from the former miners that we interviewed. It was more the widows and the, the children mm. of, of deceased minors who had a, a lot of emotional contact, uh, content to the interviews that we did with them. And so that, that was a, you know, a, a point where it, it drew me in emotionally as well as, as, as intellectually, intellectually or, or uh, scientifically. Um, I, I also remember one thing. There's a, a good friend of my family's who is Navajo, uh, who attended the opening show of our exhibit in, in Shiprock, uh, New Mexico. And I, I don't remember the date, but I would guess 1987, 88, something like that. I mean, sorry, 1997, 98, uh, when we did the first show. And, um, uh, and, and when she saw the stories and the pictures, she, you know, she burst into tears. She was crying. And I, mm-hmm. I realized how, emotion, how even more emotionally laden some of this material and, and, and the experience was for someone who was even closer uh, uh, to the people out there than, than I was. Well, would you like to describe to the audience then um, what the epidemiological data is among the Navajos who've been expo- yeah. of the miners, their families and the like? Um, what is the incidence of cancer and other diseases? Can, can you first outline that, Doug? Yeah, so the where the science stands is for the miners, the science is, is extremely strong and, and very, very clear. For the communities, the people who live near the mines, there has been far, far less research, and it's much less clear uh, what the risk is, and, and there's a need for more research. But um, with the miners, uh, both the Navajo miners and other miners, there have been studies in many countries around the world, including the United States, uh, that have shown that working in underground uranium mines, being exposed to radon, uh, dramatically increases the risk of lung cancer, and that a radon exposure interacts with cigarette smoking for those miners who are smokers 
to synergistically multiply the risk. So they're not additive. It's not 1 plus 1 equals 2, but it's more 1 plus 1 equals 3. And and so uh, for... Uh, and, and the Navajo miners are a particularly interesting example because they were left out of the early uh, studies, which focused only on white miners really? in the United is that, States. Really? Is that so? How extraordinary. Well, and, and the thinking at the time, it, it sounds racist, but I th- the thinking was you wanted a homo- homogeneous population to make it easier to do your analysis than to have uh, sort of a valid conclusion. Um, you could argue <laughs> with that, but that was the thinking at the time. The, the reason that the research eventually extended to the Navajos is because, for, to a very great extent, they're non, a non-smoking population, or were at that time. Mm. And so the question arose as to whether radon in mines could cause lung cancer in someone who didn't smoke, since most of the white miners smoked, and there was some question about that. And so studies were done looking at the Navajo miners, showing very, very high uh, risk of lung cancer, uh, increased risk of lung cancer uh, in non-smoking miners. And, um, and, and so that was how, how they were brought into the research. And the conclusion, and I'm, I'd have to paraphrase because I can't quote it exactly, was that uh, in this non-smoking population, uh, uranium mining was the primary cause of lung cancer. And what so, percentage of the uh, miners got lung cancer, Doug Brugge? Well, you know what? I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Well, in some you, studies, but, and I yeah. think it's from the German studies, it's up to 50%. I think with the uh, Navajos, it's about 30%. So the yeah, the, the, very early, uh, the very early miners in in Eastern Europe, mm. had extremely, extremely high uh, prevalence of uh, uh, rates of lung cancer. Um, and in that time, this was in the late um, uh, 1800s yes. uh, and into the early 1900s, maybe. Uh, and at that time, you know, people really didn't understand what was causing the lung cancer. They didn't mm. even understand cancer very well. Mm. But, but there were extremely high uh, rates uh, on, on that group. And, and the and the distinction is if you if you ventilate the mines, if you put fresh uh, air in and you pull out the the more polluted air, then you can dramatically reduce the exposures. And so those very early mines were were unventilated. And and the the thing that is you know is regarded as um, you know uh, an ethical failing is, uh, in the United States is that by the time uranium mining started in, in the United States in the late 1940s. It was clear that radon was the causal agent. It was clear that if you ventilated the mines, you would reduce the exposures. Mm. And yet, the government did nothing for a protracted, you know, for 15 or 20 years, or did very little, I should say, for 15 or 20 years, and 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 could have, because it was the sole purchaser and had a monopoly on buying uranium, could easily have forced the companies that were mining to install ventilation and paid a few cents extra per ton, and and prevented a lot of the deaths that happened. So. So that has, you know, it, from my thinking, and I think many other people's thinking, that that was, you know, where there was a, a substantial ethical uh, failing. And, and with regard to the Navajo miners, I think it's, it's compounded because uh, those miners did not speak English. They were not oh, uh, really educated. So they, they didn't even know that radiation existed. or, or, or that oh, there was, and, and for many of them, it was their first step into, you know, wage economy and industrial-type type jobs. So. Mm. So they were completely naive going into it, and and really blindsided when when uh, uh, the, the the miners started dying of, of this disease that they were unfamiliar with. I'm speaking to uh, Professor Doug Briggy, uh, who is in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. So, Doug, why don't you explain to the audience what radon is? Um, and and the various daughters of uranium, so that they understand that, what its half-life is, what it decays into, how it deposits yep. in the lung, and how it induces lung cancer. Right. So, so radon is a is a, a, a remarkable element. It is um, part of the decay chain uh, from uranium, which is why it's found in uranium mines. And uh, just the fact that radioactive elements, when they decay, change from one element to another is, from my perspective, a remarkable thing. So, so as uranium decays, you get thorium and radium and radon, and then radon decays into a whole series of, of daughter products, as you, as you said. 
And each of the times these, these atoms changes from one element into another, uh, uh, it gives, they give off radiation. And radon in that whole decay series is, is particular, and, and, and its properties make it particularly hazardous. And um, it is a gas, first of all. The other, the other elements in the series are solid, so they'll stand, tend to stay put, <laughs> whereas a gas will float up and get into the air. Uh, and radon has a half-life of four days, which, uh, which is important for two reasons. One, it's long enough that it can get out of cracks and crevices and up in, into the air, whether it's in a mine or whether it's in your home, which is in the basement of your home, which is built on some uranium-bearing um, uh, rocks. And so it has time to get up into the air. And you multiply and a half-life by 10 to get its total radiological life. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So we could say but, 40 days, it's around. Yeah, so some of it is going to, right, so half of it is gone in, in, four, day, yes. in four days, but then yes. it's going to continue to, yeah. to decay out from then, exactly. And, um, and then when it decays, it's up in the air, it's a gas, it's a noble gas, so it's non-reactive. If, if it just stayed radon, it would not be that much of a problem. Mm. You would breathe it in and breathe it right out again. But the problem is it changes into a series of, of solids, polonium and lead and, and other things that, um, that then want to stick on to something solid. And when they stick on to a, piece, a dust particle in the air and you breathe that in, that dust particle could stay deep in your lungs. It has the radon decay products on it, and those products will continue. Those have very short half-lives, some of them, in nanoseconds or a few seconds, or things along those lines. They will continue to give off radiation for a time in your lung. And they give off a kind of radiation, alpha radiation, which is particularly destructive uh, to the tissues. Uh, when, it's in, when it's inside the body, it's harmless outside the body, but inside the body, it's, it's 20 times more damaging than, for example, the x-rays you get when you go to the dentist. And so radon is really sort of the perfect storm of something that gets up into the air, it can get into the very sensitive tissues of your lung, and then it can un- un- the, decay- the radon daughter products can release uh, this massive uh, dose of radiation to the local tissues uh, wherever it's deposited. And for that reason, uh, you know, radon is just an exquisitely powerful carcinogen. And, and you know, it, it was both a failing ethically of, of the U.S. government to not do anything about radon uh, in the early 1950s when they knew, knew that, uh, that, it was, that it was a hazardous substance in the mines, but it was also a bit of a triumph of science that, that by, you know, 1948 or 1950, it was clear how radon operated, and, 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 we, could, and we knew uh, what it would do, that it was, that it was, why it was hazardous. And then subsequently, with all these uh, uh, epidemiology studies, as you said, in, in European countries, in China, in Canada, in the United States, and elsewhere, sh- uh, showed in human mining populations the the incredible impact that, that radon exposure had uh, in causing lung cancer in minors. Why didn't the government do anything about it? That's what absolutely bugs me, Doug. I, I just well, don't get it. Yeah. Is it because <laughs> politicians are scientifically illiterate on the whole and that they're um, sort of handmaidens, if you will, to the corporations like Kerr McGee and, and others that run these mines and so they sort of shuck it off and say, well, it doesn't really matter and it's not really significant. Is this, is this what it's about? Is it because the scientists are too lackadaisical or like to stay in their labs and not really take the politicians on too strongly? Well, you know, I, I have thought about this a lot. I think it's a really good question. Uh, I don't know that I will ever have a, a definitive answer, but I have an opinion. And my opinion is that the uranium mining was got too tied up with national security. You uh, mean nuclear the, weapons? Part of the Cold War. Yeah. That's right. And, and so the government was afraid to let anyone know anything about, uh, about their nuclear program. They were afraid that, it, you know, that maybe, maybe perhaps they were afraid that, that the companies and the miners wouldn't want to keep mining this stuff if they knew how hazardous it was. I don't know, but, but I feel like it was more tied up with national security then than anything else. And um, there, are, there are stories, there's an uh, industrial hygienist, Duncan Holliday, who advocated within the, the study, that was the public health service study in the United States that was going on, 
that, that something should be done to, to provide more ventilation. Uh, but, you know, his efforts were largely, uh, you know, not, not, uh, not listened to. Uh, there was someone else uh, that uh, within the government who tried to advocate, advocate or, or raise concerns about, about uranium and uranium mining, uh, who was basically barred from, by the government from talking uh, about it very much. So, so I, think, I think it was a general, it was a time of really heightened fears and, uh, and, and sort of uh, uh, excessive uh, focus Secrecy. on national security. So what and, years and were these, Doug? I would, uh, well, the uranium mining really in the United States didn't start until the late 1940s. And the period where uh, where where there were no federal regulations of the mines was up until about 1967. Mm. So um, so it's that that time frame where I think you know it's the height of the Cold War. There's a lot of paranoia about uh, you know, about uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, and um, mm. and it's also the period when they're building up their their nuclear arsenal and, and competing to go to the moon and building intercontinental ballistic missiles and all these kinds of things. So I, I think, you know, it's a particular period, but, but it just, to me, even, even if you accept that whole framework, it, it's unforgivable that they wouldn't just pay a little bit more money to put some ventilation in the mine. Mm, oh, yes. I, I don't see how that would compromise national security. To Not do, at all. To do it's that, just you know? ridiculous. Now, look, right. Doug, there are other elements um, that, that can be ingested in the dust uh, and when and on the miners' hands and things, like yeah. radium. And can you describe and that that those elements are in the dust in the mines too? Can you describe what, for instance, radium does and its history, uh, right. Professor Briggy? Okay, yeah, that's a good uh, good lead in for me as well. Um, Radium is a is a solid or a radioactive solid. It's it's much it has a much higher uh, specific activity. That is, it gives off a lot more radiation per unit mass for per unit time than than does uranium. Uranium itself is has a very low level of giving off off radi- radiation. But radium is higher and is of great greater concern as a radiologic element. Um, it has a, a very checkered history, at least in the United States. I, I don't know. Uh, what it, what was done with radium in uh, in Australia, but uh, you know it was uh, originally isolated by uh, Madame Curie as, as her as part of her uh, famous experiments and work, um, and then uh, and she died of aplastic anemia, that's, which is that's a form correct. of uh, bone cancer. Yeah, right. And which yeah, there's probably more of the radon, but I, I don't know what she was what what was the cause there but um but she worked with large quantities of this uranium ore uh, and then was isolating and this was in a that was in a much earlier time frame when mm. there really genuinely was not a, a good understanding of how hazardous uh, these things could be yeah um but still uh, uh radium was used uh, to paint watch dials in the united states this is the most famous example and story these young women and girls uh, were in, in factories and they would Take a radium waste paint and paint the watch dial so that they would glow in the dark. And um, from my understanding, when they when they made an error, what they would do is, is sharpen the tip of the brush in their in their uh, lips, and then correct the error with the brush. And so they ingested large amounts of radium, and that is a, a cohort of people that, that suffered significant um, uh, bone cancer as well as other health effects. Um, from their radium exposure, but the you know the doses were were massive in in, in that group. Um, there was also a, a crazy guy, and I've forgotten his name, who was running around something selling something called Radiothor, but basically to wealthy people as a a cure all. And he would take distilled water and put a little radium in it, and people would drink it. And the people who did this also became very sick, and many of them died. Uh, so uh, so radium has a very interesting history. In that regard, um, but it's interesting today. To me, one of the things that's, that's a little bit uh, frustrating and something I've been thinking about a lot is when, when people talk about the communities that live near abandoned uranium mines and, and mine tailings or, or old uranium mills, uh, they talk a lot about the uranium exposure. But 
those people are also exposed to, to radium. Yes. And I think there's been a lot less investigation of how much radium exposure they might have and how serious a threat that might uh, pose to them. And, and the same could be said of thorium, which is another radioactive element that's found in the, in the uranium ore. Yes, and radium is soluble, so that when it gets into their dams and their rivers and streams, it, 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 it dissolves and then it con- concentrates. It's taken up like a sponge by the microorganisms, which then are eaten by the crustaceans, which then are eaten by the little fish, which are then eaten by the bigger fish. And at each stage of that cycle, the radium is bioconcentrated by some orders of magnitude, like 10 to 100 times. And so it can be ingested and it's tasteless and odorless in the fish. And, and, and the cattle drink the water too, you see, and the goats and the sheep, and it concentrates in their tissues as well. Um, mostly it goes to bone, of course, but um, right. it's very toxic. And the, yes, and, and uh, it, Go on. Oh, well, the, the, um, what are the pathways by which these communities are being exposed? So yes. You just spoke of one, which is through food ingestion, but clearly the water, water, drinking water is yes. another route, and then air exposure, and, and so And then, you know, out in the Navajo area, and I think this is true in other parts of the world, I was just in communication with some people in South Africa who raised a similar issue. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, people who don't have access to building materials would take the, the tailing waste, the low level ore that had been left behind, and use it to build foundations or to make their homes. And so, uh, you know, there are a bunch of homes out there. I think now in the Navajo area, most of them have been found and, and, and um, condemned or, or torn down. But, but people were living in these homes that were, that were made out of uh, low-grade ore that had radium and thorium and uranium in the ore that were giving off radon uh, into the air that they were breathing. And, you know, so that essentially... Uh, these were families with women and children living in a home that that was uh, very much like living in a uh, in a in a, in the mine shaft itself. Yes. So, so that's a really terrible uh, legacy of this that um, you know that really should never have happened. Yes, I I wrote in my book Nuclear Madness years ago, and there's a town and I can't think of it where they did uh, make houses, as you said, out of uranium tailings. And a local paediatrician noticed a much higher than normal incidence of cleft lip, cleft palate and other congenital Mm. anomalies. And he was funded by the federal government for a year to study this, this problem, but the funding was cut off after a year and it was never completed. <laughs> so, and do you know what, what, what country was that no, in? No, it was in, in the U.S. Get, get my that book, was in the US. Yeah, Nuclear Madness, it's, it's, okay. it's in there. It's not okay. ship rock, I don't think, but it's one like that. The other thing I want to bring up, which is so interesting, uh, Doug Briggy, is that um, it's been found that as radon sort of floats around in the air, which it does all the time, it tends to deposit and land on the trichromes or the little hairs on the tobacco leaves of the tobacco plants. And it, of course, uh, converts and decays to polonium, which, as you pointed out, is a solid. Right. And polonium is an alpha emitter and, as such, is very carcinogenic. And it's been found, and there have been articles and letters in the New England Journal about this, that as, and so therefore when you crush the tobacco leaves and, and, and concentrate them, the polonium is concentrated. So when the smoker smokes, um, there's a sort of a turbulence of air at the bifurcations of the bronchi and the trachea that divides into right and left main bronchus and then into various bronchi. And the turbulence tends to cause the polonium to deposit at the bifurcation in the mucosa or or the cells lining the bronchi, where it stays for a long time, irradiating just a very small volume of cells with alpha radiation. And it is postulated, and probably almost certainly true, that one of the main causes of lung cancer induced by smoking is polonium. Right. And, and therefore and you'd have to extrapolate too that the polonium will be depositing on the food grown by the Navajos, um, yeah. you know, near the uranium mines. 
So that that raises a number of really interesting things. One is I, I think there's very little research. There is some, but there's not enough on how the radon emitting from these these waste sites disperses in the ambient yeah. air and how far away uh, the effects are. That, you know, sort of where how far away there are large enough uh, concentrations to be of concern. Um, but the other thing is that what you were describing. Um, is, is sort of putting together the uranium miners and their smoking just within the smoking, mm. which is really interesting. So maybe the smoking itself has enough polonium that already there's a synergistic effect going on. The, my understanding is what is, is, is that the, the, lead, the primary thought about how this synergy happens is that the cigarette smoke uh, knocks out the cilia in the lungs, the mucociliary That's true. That's pathway. True. Yes. And so these particles uh, tend to stay better down in the lungs and not get exported as easily. Mm. And so that maybe if you have radon-derived uh, particles and you have cigarette smoke, then those particles uh, get deeper into the lung and stay mm. there and don't get expelled as much, and so that increases your, your risk. That's true. Um, Yes, um, my specialty is is lungs, cystic fibrosis, and you know cilia. And cilia are a little tiny hairs that yep. line the uh, bronchi and the air passages, and they waft like sort of waves of in a wheat field which has been blown by wind, and so they mm. waft any particles that are inhaled. Um, up to the throat where where the stuff is swallowed, and that's right. the sort of normal cleaning mechanism of the lungs. So when you smoke, the smoking damages the cilia, and and you don't get that normal cleaning mechanism as you just pointed out. Doug, um, in Australia we've got a hell of a lot of uranium, and mm-hmm. BHP Billiton, which is a company that used to be Australian, now is owned by the Brits, the British. We don't like the British in Australia, incidentally. <laughs> anyway, because, you know, they brought us all out as convicts. But um, they, they've got a huge uranium mine in South Australia. And they use yep. 33 million litres of water from the Great Artesian Basin a day to process the uranium as they mine it. And that's archaeological water. And is, it, it comes from the Great Artesian Basin, which is a massive... Uh, amount of water underneath the huge desert in Australia, and they're going to enlarge the da- the, the the mine five times, and mm. extraordinarily increase the amount of um, of water they're getting out of the of the of the Great Artesian Basin. And they're going to generate the electricity to do this by by burning brown coal, which all adds to global warming. Yep. Um, and and but it's going to be an open cut mine. Now that means that the radon will be dispersed, and the miners well, they'll be they will be inhaling some radon for sure. But more, this is the desert, and it gets very very dry. And you see trucks of water, sort of spraying water on the roads and stuff to keep the dust down. But inevitably, they inhale the dust. And they mm-hmm. swallow the dust. Do you want to just, from a health perspective, talk about that? And also, they're exposed continuously to whole body radiation from the gamma radiation mm-hmm. being given off by the uranium um, at the ore face. Do you want to talk about that, please, Doug? Yeah, and what, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is I'd, I'd like to just start with, with, with bringing up something we haven't talked about, which is this, this effort to have a resurgence of nuclear power oh, yeah, and sure. the fact that that has really uh, reinvigorated efforts to do uranium mining. I, I don't know the sequence in Australia that well, but in the United States there was a, a period from the late 1980s until very recently. when so there Fukushima. Was essentially, yeah, well, there was essentially no uranium mining going oh, on. Oh, yeah, right. And then there was, there has been, in the last 10 years, there has been a big push to revitalize the industry and start it up again. And there is, um, and so... So Fukushima is, is, is something we could talk about that, that may be putting a little bit of a damper on that, that effort. But, um, but you know, you, I think that there are people who think that, that nuclear power is going to take off and grow, and that because of that there will be a, uh, ever-increasing markets for uranium. And so the push to mine uranium has, has I think, uh, taken on a much more of a, a much more intensity and, and pressure, and, and there are a lot of 
struggles in Virginia here in the southwest of the United States and in Mali, where I'm going in, in March, where there are pushes to, to start up new uranium mining. And then I assume in a place like Australia or Canada or Kazakhstan, where there's already massive uranium mining, that that it, it just is reinforcing keeping that going or maybe expanding it. Um, the the other thing, the thing that you were raising, though, about underground versus uh, open pit mining is a really important one. And um, and I think historically, the, the thing, you know, because most of the, the studies of uranium miners were about underground mines and the level of radon exposure in the underground mines, uh, that there has been less attention to above ground miners and the level of risk that they face. Uh, I think you're correct that it almost certainly has to be lower than than in underground mines, but I don't think that that means that it's negligible or non-existent. Um, there probably needs to be more research on the on the levels of exposure uh, and the uh, the level of risk and and the health outcomes of miners in these in these above ground mines. Um, uh, much in the in some ways like the way there needs to be research about. Um, the communities that live near the mines. That's right, their families. Well. That's right, and they're living right. in the desert. And there are so many young children, Doug, and as we know, yep. children are, far, are 10 to 20 times more radiosensitive than adults, and female children yep. are five times more sensitive than male children, I've just discovered. And, and that's, you know, that's what we heard in the, our original work with the Navajo people. That's what we heard over and over is, is, is one... Uh, these families figured out that the uranium mining was dangerous, and they immediately made this connection. Yeah. Well, the father was going to the mine uh-huh. and was coming home with dirty, filthy clothes, and his wife was washing them, and the kids were playing, bringing his lunch up to him at the mine. And what about the families and their exposure? And and that that risk is, you know, there's one really good study at the University of New Mexico that I, I hope will publish results soon, but. Um, uh, that, those risks have not been looked at uh, as carefully and as thoroughly as they, they need to well, be. Well, and they live next to the tailing stumps, and the tailings are the very, yeah. very fine, silted sort of waste from the mine containing uranium and all its daughters, and the wind yeah. blows. And uh, we have huge, right. huge dust storms in Australia. In fact, one morning a couple of years ago, People woke up in Sydney and it was all red. They could hardly see through the air. There was a huge red dust storm. And in fact, we got it done here where I live in a little fishing village. And the wind blew from the Olympic Mm -hmm. area of the Olympic Dam. And you'd have to know that some of that dust contained polonium and radon and, and radium and the whole slew of uranium daughters. It's very scary, Doug. Yeah. You know, an- another place that I, I met someone from Tajikistan a couple yes. of summers ago, and we're trying to develop some work there. And what I learned from him was, you know, uh, we thought things were bad in the southwestern U.S., where, you know, they have ina- they've responded in, in an inadequate way to these abandoned mines, and these tailings, and so forth. But they've done something. You know, the, these communities in, in Tajikistan, especially one of them that I've been educated about, Basically, when the Soviet Union dissolved and, and they all and the Soviets and the Germans all left, it was just left there. And people have been living there. They have no idea of the hazard. There's no remediation. There's no protection of any sort. There's not even a warning sign or a fence. And so, there are places where the conditions are ver- are still very very bad, uh, uh, for and, and and risky. I think for uh, the communities that 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 live next to these. Uh, former mines and mills. Oh, yeah, it's obscene. Now, look, let's get on to uh, Kerr McGee. Uh, we <laughs> okay. To, we're not going to talk about Karen Silkwood here, but we could. And Church Rock um, yeah. and, and the Sequoia Falls area. What happened, please, will you tell us, in on January the 4th, 1986, at the Kerr McGee plant in Sequoia Falls at Church Rock? Yeah, so Sequoia New Mexico. Falls. Uh, yes, the Cliff Fuels was in Oklahoma. Oh, Oklahoma, sorry. Yes, and the Church Rock is in New Mexico. Oh. So the so Cliff Fuels uh, uh, was the plant. So when you mine uranium, first you dig it out of the ground, then you take it to a mill and it's converted into yellow cake, which is a purified form of, of uranium that, that's still not pure, but it's, it's 
much more enriched for uranium and it's gotten rid of a lot of other. What's a chemical process um, that turns it into yellow cake, Doug? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I think up they on the use sulfur. Process. I think they use high sulfur, sulfuric yeah. acid. But you don't know. I'm interested in well, that. Well, there is acid involved. but yeah. I, I, I'm not a, no. an expert on that. Okay. In the industrial so, process. So it's turned to yellow they, cake. Yep. Then. Yeah, which is which is an oxide of uranium. Yes. And um, and then they then they ship that to what's called uh, a conversion plant. And yes. I think people have not thought much about these conversion plants. In order to make uh, uranium into something that can be used uh, for nuclear power or nuclear weapons, you have to enrich it. And that, and you can't do that when it's a solid. And these conversion plants, what they do is they take the yellow cake and they can convert it into uranium hexafluoride, which is a gas. And um, so this is another industrial process that uses, uses hydrofluoric acid, which is a highly corrosive and toxic uh, acid. And they make this... Um, uh, this gas, and they put it into um, uh, uh, cylinders, big uh, cylinders that are compressed, you know, compressed gas cylinders, and then they transport it off to the facilities that enrich the uranium. And, and people have heard in the news uh, concerns about these centrifuges in Iran that are, hmm. that are enriching uranium or, or whatever. So, and I think there are a number of different processes by which you can enrich uranium. But Sequoia Fuels was an enrichment plant. It, would, it, would, it, made, this, it made the uranium hexafluoride. And uh, in the time frame you were talking about, and you had it in front of you, and I can't quote it as easily as you can, but uh, they had uh, one of these cylinders that uh, uh, they overfilled. The gauge on the cylinder was, was broken, so they didn't realize it was full. They kept pumping more gas into the cylinder until it reached a point where it, it, um, it, it broke and eventually released uh, a huge plume of this uranium hexafluoride. Uh, it killed one of the workers in the plant. Uh, other workers went to the hospital, and then uh, people in the community also, some of them, uh, went to the hospital, although I think none of them had uh, immediate acute injuries that, that were very serious. Um, and I think there the, you know, the, har- the, the death was, was more from the, to- the acidity of the um, the uh, the fluoride more than the ra- the radiation, the corrosion, toxicity. yes, right, the corrosion. Uh, but you know, it's a story that, um, like many others, has not gotten much attention. You know, everyone can knows about Three, Three Mile Island. Although I say that everyone in our generation know about Three Mile Island, but I asked my students last semester, and none of them knew what it was. So no. that was a little disturbing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but Three Mile Island, you can look up and you can find things, and a lot of people have heard of it, at least if they were, uh, you know, a young adult or, or a teenager by the time that that, that, that happened. But Sequoia Fuels is, is, a, is a release of uranium and radiation, an industrial release that led to one clear, clear death and, and a bunch of other injuries uh, that is not so well known. The other case that you mentioned is the Church Rock spill, which uh, interestingly happened uh, within a couple of months of Three Mile Island but received very little publicity and attention. Church Rock is in uh, New Mexico now. And um, uh, that, uh, that event, there was a, a, a dam at a, at a uranium mill uh, that gave way. It was, it was poorly constructed, an earthen dam that, that broke, and, and just tons of, of uh, uh, uranium tailing uh, so containing very water. very fine, fine mud. Well, I think it was it was liquid, you know, liquid. that rushed down yeah. down this yeah. this this. Uh, out there, they call things rivers that most of us <laughs> wouldn't call rivers, but it's the Perco River, which uh, you know is dry half the time, but uh, raced down this river and, and off into the wilderness. Um, the you know the the effects of that are still you know there were some investigations afterwards, but the the total effects are not that well known. The the event itself was clearly a, a much larger radioactive release than, than Three Mile Island, um, but uh, received substantially less less attention, uh, I think, because you know it, it happened in a rural area with in, around uh, Native American populations where there was not a major media market, and 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 also because it was at what well, we started out talking about it was at the beginning stages of the nuclear cycle and not. Um, and not as as sexy and exciting as as a nuclear power plant. 
Yeah, I suppose it's not as sexy and exciting, but it's, uh, you know, <laughs> Americans, well, white people invaded the United States before it was the United States and stole the land from the Native American Indians. And we did exactly the same thing in Australia. We stole the land from the Aborigines. We call it terra nullis, which meant that no one was living on it. And as the Aboriginal people stood and watched these British arrive in their sort of red uniforms and plant the Union Jack on the shores of Sydney Harbour at the time, you know, they they were kind of bemused and, and anxious and they didn't know what was happening. And then they tried to help the people and then they got slaughtered and killed and decimated and their water holes were poisoned and now they live in terrible poverty. Um, and, of course, where is the uranium uh, in Australia? It's on their land. Where do we want to put the radioactive waste dump? We want to put it on Aboriginal tribal land. Do we want to bring back a, a American radioactive waste? It's quite possible that a deal was done between our Prime Minister and your then-President uh, George II to import nuclear waste from America and put it on Aboriginal tribal land. So, you know, got what... What goes around comes around. These are the people that really suffer the most, don't they, Doug? Yeah, and you know what what really strikes me is is that story that you just told. It could be told in the United States as well. Uh, you know, with the Navajo people, they were they were uh, forced off their land at one time, but then allowed back onto it. But the irony is, uh, I think you know uh, the U.S. government thought the land was, was pretty much worthless, but then it turned out to have all this uranium and coal yeah. uh, under it at a later, at a later stage. Um, but, but everywhere I look, when you know, I was visiting with people from India recently, and there are indigenous people mm. uh, living next to uranium mines mm. in India, and that the story just goes on and on, and I, I think this connection to indigenous uh, of uranium mining and its impact on indigenous communities is is very widespread. I, I don't think it's universal. I think there are other examples, but certainly in Canada there are uh, yes, in, in Canada, yes, I've been there. First Nation um, mm. uh, groups that are opposing more uranium mining on their land or near where they live, and so, so I think it's a very common theme. And um, I would not have thought I would have thought when I started that the Navajo experience was just the Navajo experience and not really imagined that it was replicated all over the world in, in sort of very familiar, if not not exactly identical, kinds of patterns. So, Doug, are you getting more and more involved nationally and internationally on this issue of uranium mining from your perspective as a professor of public health and community medicine? Yeah, it, it, you know, my starting point was doing this project with, with the Navajo people, and I've been drawn into uh, uh, the issue on, on, on both a national and international level. So I've, I've been engaged by people in Virginia where there's a huge uranium deposit that, that some people want to open up and, and start mining. I've been there twice in the last few years uh, to talk about uranium there. Uh, I've been drawn into uh, folks in Telluride, Colorado, who are concerned about renewed mining uh, in their area. Uh, as I said, I've been doing some work with colleagues in Tajikistan. I've met with folks uh, from India who are addressing uranium mining. So, but yeah, I, I think it's sort of uh, spread out, and there, I think uh, uh, that there are a couple of ways that, that because I have sort of a, a level of technical expe uh, expertise and a, and a grasp on some of the literature, that, that I can contribute something uh, uh, to some of these, these folks who are trying to understand what they're dealing with and think about it. Um, and so, so I think that's sort of the basis that I, that I get drawn in, into it. Well, as I talk to you, I wonder whether we shouldn't invite you to Australia where we're having this huge problem and the media are simply not attending to it. The people who are mining uranium are not educated at all, the, the union mm. workers, about the dangers of mining uranium. Their families who live adjacent to the mill tailings and the mines are not taught about the dangers to their children and their embryos. And yeah. Would you be interested in coming to Australia, Doug Brady? <laughs> yes, it, there, there are there are two conditions. One, I, I'd have there would have to be some way to to pay for my travel, yes. and then the other would be we'd have to convince my wife that I could be away that long. <laughs> I know it's difficult, but I think if it? we could solve the first one, we could work on the second one, and, and probably be able to do it. Yes, well, uh, you 
I'm, I'm very committed to this issue. I, you know, when I started out, I thought I was doing one little project that would last a couple of years, and I'd move on. And now it's, you know, it's uh, 15 years later, and I'm still doing it. So I, I don't think there's any end in sight. 15 years. Do you think you're making an impact? What, what, what do you think of the results of your work thus far? Um, yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's always difficult to tell what, what impact a single individual has, but I know that I have been a part of things where I was one piece of a larger effort mm. that has had an impact. And, and you mentioned uh, my uh, testimony to Congress in your introduction, and that, uh, that you know, I was one little part. It was the, the Navajo Nation and it was the main, were the main testifiers, but they had me there again sort of as the, the technical expert to, to uh, uh, vouch for the science. And, uh, you know, that hearing and the things that followed that hearing have led to a, a substantial... Uh, effort, which I, I don't think is perfect by any means, but is much more than was there before, to begin remediating some of the, the um, abandoned mines out there. And the, one of the first ones that they addressed was recently completed. Uh, that mine in particular uh, had attracted a fair amount of media con- attention, both Good. in a Lo- Los Angeles Times series and in a book and in a movie that someone had made. Good. And so I think that mine got got first dibs on... How do you on remediate? Resources. How do you remediate a uranium mine, Doug Briggy? Right. So, so notice I didn't say clean up. I've, no. I've, got, I've taught I myself not to say clean up because yes. uranium doesn't go away no. uh, and the decay products don't go away. They're around forever from our perspective. Um, so so mostly what you do is you, you take the, the tailings and the, and the contaminated soil that's, that's exposed and you move it somewhere and bury it and cover it over and fence it off and and then sort of monitor it uh, over time. You put and it back from where it came. You, you try to. Try. Yeah, although, you know, and, and they've done this with the old mills in the, United, in the United States, and they've done it some with, they're starting to do this some with the mines. Mm. And the, the problem is, uh, you know, you may still have uh, leakage uh, uh, through the, the, um, the, 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 the decommissioning cell that you've, created that that's leaking down the groundwater so you may still have stuff seeping off into the into the nearby river all the yeah near a river yeah and so i don't think that they're perfect but they are attempts to respond and, and it gives you some sense of of the relative value of that to nothing when when you look at a place like T- tajikistan in my opinion mm. but but I, I don't think um i don't think that they're perfect but what they did uh, at this one, at Oljato, Ol- this one mine in, in Monument Valley uh, sounded pretty good to me. But, you know, you really have to see what it looks like 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road. Has, huh. has it held up? Is it deca- deteriorating? Let alone, Is, let alone thousands of years down the road, eh, Doug? Well, they're going to be there forever. Oh, yeah. So, uh, right. So, and that, that's a, a very worrisome problem, not, not only with uranium mining, but with nuclear nuclear, high-level nuclear waste as well, uh, which will be around a lo- not as long, but but a long time. Well, the EPA says a million years. For uranium? No, for radio- radioactive waste. Oh, for, it must be confined for, the, for, for a million years. For the high-level waste, yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, look, we've come to the end of our discussion and our time. Uh, yeah. Doug Brugge, I thank you very, very much for this elucidating and uh, exposure of of the medical dangers of of mining uranium, which is the beginning of the whole nuclear fuel cycle and chain and nuclear power and weapons, and uh, we'd very much like to see you in Australia if I could try and orchestrate it. Well, I'd, I'd love to come as long as we can can figure out the details. Yes, it's a pleasure talking to you. And, yes, um, and it's, it's great to get the the uranium mining. Uh, issue out in in another in another uh, uh, forum. Yeah, very important. Well, thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Okay, thank thank you, Helen. Thank you, Doug. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was Doug Briggy, a professor in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts. Thanks for listening today, everyone. Encourage your friends and relatives and even your enemies to listen to this program because what we talk about I think is imperative for everyone to know in this uh, day and age of ours. And uh, I encourage you to listen again next week 
to another hopefully fascinating program. Bye for now.